greetings and welcome to Easter services at home. We're really pleased that you've chosen to be with us this morning. I'm gonna ask you now to lean in a little bit and listen to the best news ever according to the Gospel of Matthew. After the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Go quickly and tell his disciples. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him and clasped his feet and worshiped him. Friends, the, the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. And just like the women at the tomb, we today have cause to bring our worship before our risen Lord. I can't think of a better way to begin a resurrection service than the singing of a, of a hymn that's been sung by Christ's followers for nearly 300 years. Christ the Lord is risen today. And we have something special for you today. It's gonna to be the first ever Christ Community Church virtual Easter choir. And a virtual choir, it's, it's a beautiful representation of the body of Christ. Separate, but certainly not alone. We can raise our voices together wherever we might be in worship of our risen King. Christ the Would you please join us wherever you might be? And we lift our voices together and sing verses two, three, and four. Lives again, our glorious King. Lives again, our glorious King. Alleluia. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting. traditional 
Easter greeting goes something like this. He is risen, he is risen indeed. And so I'm going to say he is risen and then wherever you might be, please respond, he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Now, enjoy some Easter greetings from living rooms across the metro area. Happy Happy from the Falkies. Hey. Yeah? You know what? What? He is risen. He is risen indeed! From, from the, the Bourne family, family, Happy Easter! Happy Easter! Happy Easter! Happy Easter from the Smith family. Happy Easter from the Magnusons. May the good news of our risen King and Savior bring fresh hope into your life this Easter. Look at me and say, Happy Easter from the Evans boys. Happy Easter, I'm so angry. No, you're not. <laughs> say, Happy Easter from the Evans no, family. Tina. Amen, that's true. And we celebrate today the risen Savior. We hope you join us and connect with God in a worshipful way from wherever you are. Would you sing with us? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Shakes the whole
Beside the lie of inward shame, we fix our eyes upon the cross and run to Him who showed great love and bled for us. Freely you bled for us. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. to the one who has defeated death, who the victory is his, and because of that, we can celebrate this new life that is promised through Christ Jesus. And together, the family of God declares, amen, amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives
happy Resurrection Day. It is so awesome to know that in dozens of homes throughout our city and throughout the country and even the world, there are people celebrating the fact that Jesus lives. Hey, we are so excited that you are here, that you're joining us right now. My name is Alex, and I get to serve as one of the ministers here at CCC, and we're just grateful that you've chosen to worship our risen Savior with us this morning, wherever you are. We'd love to see where you are. We'd love to see how you're worshiping. You can tag us on any social media at CCC Omaha with that handle, and we'd love to, to see what's happening and where you're worshiping Jesus at this morning. Hey, we're excited to, to have you here, and we're excited that all the kids are even watching as well. And if you missed a little bit earlier, we talked about a coloring sheet that kids are going to be able to do during the service. And so if you go to cccomaha.org, you're going to be able to find on there the Kids at Home page. There's going to be a coloring sheet that they're going to be able to fill out as Pastor Mark gives his message a little bit later on. And there's going to be fun clues, interactive things that we had illustrated on, illustrated on there. So we'd love for you to check that out as well. Hey, uh, if you're new, we want to know who you are. We're excited that you're here, that you're in a living room, that, you're, that you've seen somebody share this somewhere throughout the week, and we want to know who you are. So there's going to be a link in the description below, and, and it's going to be a way for you to tell us who you are. We'd love to know who you are and connect with you throughout the week. And so if you go to cccomaha.org slash new, you can uh, fill out just some quick information about who you are. Well, hey friends, one of the ways we always worship Jesus, our risen Savior, is through singing and also through giving. And we're so grateful for the people that have given over the last few weeks. And we're not just giving to, to create some building because we're a church that's scattered right now, but we're giving uh, because the, the Lord of the universe has invited us to partner with him in his mission of redeeming and restoring a, a broken world. And so we'd love for you to give. If you're somebody who is a part of CCC, you call it home. If not, totally disrespect regard all of that. Just enjoy the service. Enjoy what Jesus is doing uh, today through this experience. And we've loved seeing how people have stepped up to give over the last few weeks, given thousands of meals to families in need, given thousands of medical supplies to people uh, that, are, that are in the medical profession in our city. And so you are such a giving church, and we celebrate that. Thank you so much for stepping up, especially in the midst of this pandemic. We've seen so many people step into this, this world that's different and have to do ministry on the fly. I know there's one guy I'm thinking of right now. I, I got to do ministry uh, in, the, in the middle school for a lot of years, and I met a, a guy named Raleigh who had been doing middle school ministry for over 30 years. And, and Raleigh, he, he's not a guy that's been great, big on texting or uh, Zoom calls. All of those things were totally foreign to him. He's, he's a gruff guy who always wears shorts. If you come here on Sunday mornings, you will see Raleigh with a smile on his face, shaking your hands in the atrium above the stairs. But Raleigh, uh, because of the importance of connecting with his students, has decided he's going to learn Zoom and connect with his guys. And it's been so fruitful to see uh, people that have taken huge next steps in the middle of this pandemic uh, to do ministry to other people. And we know there's so many Raleigh's out there, so many people that this is awkward, it's weird, it's clunky, it's all new. But we thank you for, for taking the detour with us uh, for the sake of, of God's gospel going forward, for the sake of relationships, for the sake of the church gathering together and, and being in unity with one another. Hey, I want to let you know one last thing before Pastor Mark comes. Next week, we're starting a new sermon series, and I'm super excited about this sermon series. We had a meeting about it on Wednesday, and I'm excited for where God has led us in this sermon series. It's called House Arrest, and it's on the book of Philippians, which is one of my favorite books. It's about Paul, who is in the middle of house arrest, and maybe you feel like right now you're in house arrest, and this is going to be a great series for you. But it's how Paul endured in the middle of this and the way that Paul wrote. And so we'd love for you to engage, come back with us next week, engage in that series of house arrest in the following weeks. Hey, Pastor Mark has got a great message uh, from the Holy Spirit for you today. So let's pray before we get into the message. Jesus, thank you for rising. Thanks you that you are so good. Thank you that you died and today you rose again and you beat death once and for all. And we get to live in that freedom. God, I pray that everybody watching today would, would sense and feel your spirit. As a scattered church gathered through homes throughout uh, the country and the world, God, would, would we sense and feel your presence? 
God, would you speak through Mark in a powerful way? Would you speak to our hearts in a powerful way? Jesus, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you've beat death. Thank you for Easter and the resurrection. We pray this in your holy, humble name. Amen. Well, happy Easter, everyone. I think that this Easter is going to be remembered not only as the Easter where we experience church at home, but the same week where we started wearing masks uh, for everybody else's benefit and uh, enjoying that. In fact, I've collected a number of different pictures of creative ways that people have been using their masks uh, in order to be able to help spread uh, or to help stop the spread, that is, of the coronavirus. First of all, we've got Corona Grandma. Corona Grandma here in uh, this mask. Yeah, she's put on some creative ways of uh, putting together her face mask. That's beautiful. All right, next one up, we've got the uh, dog walker who not only put the mask on, but has created an entire rain outfit in order to make sure that they don't get the coronavirus. Oh, and by the way, their dog is fully wrapped in saran wrap as well, just to be sure. And in case you didn't notice, there's actually even the dog do bag is wrapped in uh, is wrapped in plastic so we can make sure that that is safe as well. All right, the next guy here, he is the guy who's got mixed messages, like I'm all for my health and I'm all against my health, all at the exact same time with his mask. And if things keep going in this direction, I think eventually we're going to be, yeah, looking like these people. This is the next order coming out from the CDC uh, for coronavirus masking as we head towards the future. Well, friends, it is uh, something that we're going to be remembering this week, but what we really remember more than anything else is that the most important event in all world history is what we're celebrating today, and that is the resurrection of Jesus. One more time, I'll say he is risen. You say he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And I know some of you may be a little bit disappointed with how that played out in your living room. Like just not as enthusiastic as being in a room with a thousand people who are cheering at the top of their lungs. And maybe you're a little bit disappointed today as well because, you know, the family gathering's not going to be as big. The church service is not quite as full of people as it was before. Maybe the Easter egg hunt is just not as epic as it once was. And the truth is, I got some things that I'm missing too. I love having a full church on Easter Sunday. And I love our family kickball game that we do every Easter afternoon. And those things are just not going to be able to happen today. But my hope and my prayer has been for all of you that maybe, just maybe, taking away some of the trappings and busyness and distractions of Easter can help us all to focus in on the thing that's most important. And that is that Jesus beat death on resurrection day and that we can all be free and experience resurrection along with him. That maybe all of us could lean into and experience the Easter story in ways that we haven't before because we can be less distracted than we were before. Hey, I want to do one more of those poll questions related to the Easter story, just to see where everybody's at. If you weren't here during the pre-service, you can pull out your phones, and the phone number's going to come up right there on the screen. And I'd love for everybody to vote on your favorite Easter character. Besides Jesus, Jesus is the obvious favorite Easter character. But besides Jesus, who's your favorite character from the Easter story? And you can vote for any of these people. You can vote for the women who discovered the empty tomb. I mean, they were boss. They got up early in the morning. They discovered that the tomb was empty. Maybe your favorite is Doubting Thomas, you know, who said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I see the scars in his side, I'm not going to be able to believe. Maybe you're somebody who says, no, 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 Nicodemus. He's my favorite. Nicodemus with the body bag. He's my favorite Easter character. Or some people may say, the bunny. The bunny is my favorite Easter character. Yeah, votes are coming in. We're getting a lot of votes in there. I know if I was voting at this point, I would be voting for Doubting Thomas because I'm just that kind of guy. I'm a skeptical guy. I'm the type of person who needs evidence in order to be able to see that something really is real. And uh, that would be where I'd at. I'd be on the blue one. But it looks like the favorite of all the favorites here is the women who discovered that the tomb was empty. You got to love the women, their boldness, their courage to be able to go out when other people were scared. And by far the least on this is Nicodemus, least favorite character in the Easter story. Well, you know what? Today, I'm going to be focusing in on the person who you deemed the least favorite character in the Easter story. 
And my hope is that by the end of the message, you'll go, oh, he was a lot better character than I thought he was. His name is Nicodemus. And the Easter story is not the first time that Nicodemus was uh, encountering Jesus. In fact, in the book of John, we see three different times that Nicodemus comes into play. The first time was two years earlier, probably in the Garden of Gethsemane, the same place that Jesus prayed before he died. That's probably where Nicodemus intercepted Jesus in this encounter. And I've asked my friend Milo if he might help us tell that story. Milo, Are you out there? Can you help us with this uh, Nicodemus story? Oh, ah, hiya. Hey, hello there. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hey, um, happy Easter. Wow, ah, you you sure are looking sharp today. Yeah, you you look great. Oh, I like that tie. Nice tie. Oh, ah, I I wish I had a tie. Oh, ah, anyway, ah, um, welcome to Channel 3 News. I'm Milo, and today I will bring you a very important update, straight from my living room. Yeah, here's my living room. Just like everybody, I'm stuck at home too. But I still gotta bring you the news. So, I've been talking with a very important public figure. That's right, very important public figure. Can you guess who I'm talking to? Uh, No, no, it's not, it's not Trump. No, who said Trump? No, I I was just talking with Nick himself. Oh, oh, uh, you you don't know Nick? Oh, well, um, let's see, a great guy, Pharisee, his robes are always clean, Jewish leader, you know, Nick. Anyway, he told me that he had quite the night. He went to go see Jesus. You, You do know who Jesus is though, right? Okay, good, good, good. He went to go see Jesus in the middle of the night. I don't know why. Why would anybody go see somebody in the middle of the night? That's weird if you ask me. He went to go see Jesus in the middle of the night. Yeah, and you know what? He said this. He said, okay, so I know that you're from God because you're doing all these miracles and stuff. And then Jesus jumps in and says, yeah, and if you want to see the kingdom of God yourself, you're going to have to be born again. Born again? That, that's not even possible. I don't fully understand how I was even born the first time, you know? Like, how was I even born, right? How was, really, really though, how was I born? I don't, I don't know. But then Jesus says, yeah, for real. If you want to see the kingdom of God, you're going to have to be born of water and spirit. Then he goes on to say, what's flesh is flesh and what's spirit is spirit. You must be born again by the spirit. At this point, Nick is still super confused, but Jesus just keeps on trying. He says, you know that the wind blows wherever it wants to. You can hear it in the trees, but that doesn't mean you know where it came from or where it's going. It's the same with everyone born from above, by the wind of God or the spirit of God. At this point, I'm surprised that Nick was still willing to put himself out there, but he still doesn't get it. Honestly, I don't think I get it either. I mean, I thought the wind in Nebraska usually came from Alaska. That's why it's so cool. But Nick asks, what are you talking about? How does this happen? I almost imagine Jesus laughing when he says, you're such a fancy teacher, and yet you don't understand these basics? I'm trying as simply as I can to tell you. I only talk about things I've seen with my own eyes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to tell you the truth, but you're choosing not to accept or believe it. How then will you believe things that are harder to see? Honestly, I'm not sure I understand any of this born again stuff myself. Then Jesus goes on to talk about how we should love the light. I mean, I love the light. It's how we see things in the daytime. But maybe he was saying that because Nicodemus was coming to him in the middle of the night, which, if you ask me, is really, really weird. I don't know. Maybe Pastor Mark has some better ideas on all of this born again stuff. Back to you, Pastor Mark. Well, Milo, the truth is that Nicodemus never got back with Jesus again to hear the explanation of what it means to be born again. In fact, that's all of the explanation that we have in the Bible. It's interesting because Nicodemus was known as Israel's teacher. 
That means not only was he a part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, but he was considered to be one of the elite teachers on that council. Israel's teacher. And so Jesus kind of knocks him off his feet by using terms like wind and born again. And, you know, that idea of born again is something we don't know if Nicodemus ever caught it. But what Jesus was saying there is simply that there is a starting point for your spiritual life, just like there was a starting point for your physical life. There's a day that you were born. There is a day that you're born again. And that you don't get into the family of God by being good enough or being religious enough or going to church or performing the right things. There is a very real spiritual rebirth that has to take place in somebody's life. Now, Nicodemus was on a spiritual journey. One of the things we notice is that Nicodemus came late at night to go and see Jesus. Why? Well, partly to protect his reputation. He didn't want his fellow Pharisees and Sanhedrin to find out that he's now talking to Jesus, who's kind of the enemy at the time. Not only that, but we see uh, in that moment that the nighttime visit of Nicodemus is a metaphor as a well as a way of protecting his reputation. And the metaphor is this, that Nicodemus himself is in spiritual darkness. And as Jesus keeps on teaching him, he encourages him to come into the light. And Nicodemus does take steps in that direction. In fact, in John chapter 7, we find Nicodemus being the only member of the Sanhedrin who will speak up for Jesus. They wanted to put him on trial, but Nicodemus says, no, or they wanted to condemn him. Nicodemus says, no, no, at least you got to put him on trial first to see if he's guilty before you find him to be guilty. Nicodemus is taking steps towards the light, but it's in John chapter 19 that we see Nicodemus moving from darkness to light. John chapter 19, beginning at verse 38, it's a part of the story of Easter that we oftentimes skip over because it doesn't really happen during the crucifixion scene on Friday, and it doesn't really happen on Easter Sunday. It happens kind of early Friday evening as the Friday is moving to a Jewish Saturday. That's when their days would start, was in the evening. And it's at that time that you see Nicodemus coming onto the scene late afternoon on Friday. This is John chapter 19, verse 38. Here's what it says. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. And with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. And Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and the strips of linen. And this was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby... They laid Jesus there. Now, if you go to Jerusalem, you'll find that there are two places that are considered to be the possible historical locations of Jesus' tomb. One of them is the one that's probably the most historically accurate, but it's the most emotionally dissatisfying because they built a big church over it and it's very ornate and you don't get a sense of what it was like at the time, but you can still go in and see that the tomb is empty. The other place is probably less historically accurate, but they've tried to maintain it to look like it was during the time of Jesus, and you get the experience of being there. It's called the Garden Tomb, and it's right next to a place where they used to crucify people, so it may have been the actual place. And you can walk into this garden, check out this picture, you can walk into this garden and actually see a hole in the wall where there was a tomb that might have been the very tomb of Jesus. And as you're able to walk in, you can go in and see what a tomb looked like and see that there is no body there, that Jesus has risen from the dead. And this is the key message of Easter. His body was wrapped. His body was laid in an empty tomb. Now, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are the guys who did this, who wrapped up the body. And Joseph, we find out, was a secret follower of Jesus. But as soon as you go to Pilate, In the middle of the afternoon, and you say, Pilate, we would like to be the ones who take the body of Jesus, your secret is out. 
Joseph's secret was out. Nicodemus's secret was out. He used to visit Jesus at night. He used to be known as Nick at night, which, you know, those of you in your 20s say, I grew up on Nick at night. Well, he moved from being Nick at night to now being Nick in the daytime where he came to get the body of Jesus. One of the interesting things that we find out is that uh, Jesus or Nicodemus brought 75 pounds, 75 pounds of linens and spices to embalm the body. Now, you may not have a context for this, but in ancient times in general, they would bring about one liter of spices and it would help preserve the body and it would help it to stink less as it's decaying. But we find out that Nicodemus is honoring Jesus by bringing 75 pounds of spices. Now, that would have cost him a lot of money, probably about $100,000 in today's terms. That's an amazing amount of gift. Nicodemus, Israel's teacher, was honoring Jesus because he thought an awful lot of Jesus. I mean, that would be like bringing five of those 15-pound bags of sugar to help embalm the body. It would be like carrying along with you two of those 40-pound pellets of salt that you put in your water softener to embalm the body of Jesus. That's what Nicodemus brought because that's how highly he thought of Jesus. By this time, Nicodemus had turned from being a secret follower to be saying somebody, I want to honor him as highly as anybody gets honored in their death. And so that's what Nicodemus does. You wonder, why did Nicodemus make that transition? I mean, maybe it was the miracles that Jesus had done. Maybe he watched Jesus' teachings and finally understood what it meant to be born again. Or maybe it was what happened on Friday at the cross. You know, Nicodemus was probably there in the Sanhedrin when they found Jesus guilty and sent him to Pilate. I wonder, as he developed his belief, what did he think in that moment? And I imagine that maybe Nicodemus went to the place, it wasn't that far away, where Jesus was crucified. And perhaps he was one of the people who was standing in the outskirts and looking up at Jesus as he was dying on the cross, his whipped body and the crown of thorns and hanging on the cross. And perhaps his heart was broken. And maybe he heard Jesus cry out that one-liner, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that one liner was not just a cry of anguish. It was a tip off to people who were Bible scholars. Nicodemus being a Bible scholar would know, oh, that's the first line of Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, it starts off by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it gives a graphic description of the Messiah's death. It says things like, I was surrounded by my enemies. They came around me like dogs. They hurled insults at me. And one of the lines in there says, they pierced my hands and feet. Now, Psalm 22 is written a thousand years before Nicodemus or Jesus was around. Hundreds of years before crucifixion had even been invented as a form of capital punishment. And yet it predicts that the Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. Not only that, but there would be people who would gather around at the foot of his execution and gamble for his clothes. And I imagine Nicodemus' mind reeling, oh my goodness, this death for the Messiah was predicted a thousand years ago, and now I'm seeing it for the first time. It's all being fulfilled right in front of my eyes. And so Nicodemus says, I'll take the body. And Nicodemus and Joseph take the body down. And they didn't have to move it very far because the crucifixion zone was right next to where the tomb was. They laid the body down and they brought the spices and they tenderly, carefully wrapped it. You know, in their culture, they were a lot more comfortable with death. Death was something that was graphic. A crucifixion would have been done at a crossroads. People would have died in their homes rather than in hospitals or other places. Kids would have been exposed to death at an early age and would have asked those kinds of questions. It's interesting that in the United States, we kind of quarantine and sanitize death. Oftentimes it'll happen in a hospice center or in an ICU. Kids don't see it and oftentimes don't even come to the services afterwards. And when it happens, bodies are taken and they're dressed up really nicely and makeup is put on and their hands are folded peacefully. 
People come and see the well-presented body and have a well-orchestrated service for an hour, express their condolences, and get on with life. It's been sanitized and quarantined here. But one of the interesting things about this coronavirus time is that death is really being thrown in our face. If you watch the news, you'll see the death tickers and comparing today's number of deaths to yesterday's number of deaths. People are wearing masks and dramatically changing their behavior. Why? Because of the fear of death. Because of the fear of death hitting more and more people. And I wonder, I wonder if perhaps the flip side of the coronavirus might wind up being a blessing to all of us. Because it gets us to begin thinking about that question of death. In fact, it's the biggest question that has ever been asked by humanity. People of every culture, of every age, for thousands of years, have been asking the same most compelling question that people have to ask when they come face to face with death. And that's this question that's answered on Easter Sunday. Because Easter is where the deepest question of life is answered. The question, can I cheat death? Easter is important and it's celebrated every year because it answers the question, can I cheat death? I mean, you think about the Easter story. It starts off with the concept of Good Friday, which is the biggest grief day in all of history, where the best man with the perfect life dies the most horrific death possible. It's grief day. But it's greeted two days later on Easter Sunday by the biggest hope day in all of world history. The biggest grief day complemented by the biggest hope day because Jesus' body being laid in a brand new tomb hewn out of solid rock with a big stone rolled across the front is not the end of the story. The end of the story comes on Easter Sunday or at least the next chapter of the story when the women in their boldness show up at that tomb to pay their respects. And what they find there is something that nobody ever expected. They found that the guards were gone. They found that the the stone had been rolled away. And when they looked inside the tomb, what they found was no body. And nobody expected no body. It was the moment that Jesus, that they realized Jesus has risen from the dead. The angels met them there and said, he has risen from the dead, just as he said. And they ran back and they told the guys and the guys heard the news and John and Peter ran ahead to the tomb and John records that Peter went into the tomb first, but I ran the fastest. I actually got to the tomb first because he's a guy and he's got to brag a little bit about, you know, how fast he was and getting to the tomb. So he says, I got to the tomb first. Peter went inside, but they found the same thing. No body. And nobody ever expected no body. But that wasn't the end of the story. I think that we can reasonably speculate that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea went to check the tomb. And this is important because there was a theory that rolls around out there that maybe the women didn't quite get it right. I mean, after all, they were filled with grief. They were hysterical. They're women, after all. Maybe they went to the wrong tomb. And I think that it's possible that they could have gone to the wrong tomb. And it's possible that Peter and John, who went afterwards, could have gone to the wrong tomb as well. But there is no way that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea went to the wrong tomb. It was, it was Joseph's tomb. They laid him there the day before. They knew where he was. And the guards and the Pharisees and everybody who saw him crucified couldn't have all gone to the wrong tomb. No, one of the great facts of world history is that the tomb is empty. And that wasn't the final chapter of the story. That's the climax of the story that Jesus rose from the dead, but he had an encore. He came back and he had dinner with the guys. He had breakfast on the beach. He met people walking along the road as they went to the city of Emmaus. He appeared to the women in the garden. He appeared one time to 500 people at the same time. See, Jesus rose from the dead. And he said, you too can rise from the dead. In fact, Jesus was quoted as saying, whoever believes in me will have eternal life. And the reason why you can have eternal life is because Jesus broke the death barrier, made a pathway possible for you to experience eternal life. This is the hope that we have. 
You want to answer that big question of all time, the question that people ask, can I cheat death? And the answer to that question is a resounding and powerful, yes, you can cheat death. Here's the reason why. Nicodemus' story is included in the Bible, I'm convinced, because eventually Nicodemus probably became friends with John. They were a part of this New Testament community. Nicodemus went public with his faith when he took Jesus' body down from the cross. John was one of the early leaders. I wonder if they didn't become buds. I wonder if Nicodemus didn't become a consultant on the Old Testament scriptures to the New Testament community. Nicodemus demonstrates to us that, yes, there are people who are poor, uneducated fishermen who come to faith in Christ, but there are also people who are wealthy scholars, that if they are sincere in following Jesus, they too can cheat death and have eternal life. You know, I've done a lot of funerals uh, in my day. And what oftentimes happens at funerals is either people have confidence that this person has trusted in Jesus and they have eternal life, or they come up with a story like this. You know, Bill was a really good person. He, he was a good guy, and I'm sure he got into heaven because he was a good person. But you got to know that the Bible never teaches that you get into heaven or experience eternal life because you were a good person. The Bible teaches that all of us are a broken mess and we need somebody to hand us resurrection power in order to break the power of sin and death and evil and break the very power of the grave. And it's by Jesus handing us that resurrection power that we're able to break the death barrier. I remember the very first funeral that I ever did. It was for my assistant. Her name was Carla Potter, and she served at the last church that I was in, Willow Creek in the Chicago suburbs. And we hired Carla just after they hired me to come on staff in the ministry I was a part of. And Carla was everything that you would want in an assistant. She was administratively savvy. She was responsible. She was smart. She loved Jesus. She led a group of people who were discovering Jesus in her city of Harvard, Illinois. She wanted the job, and she was a blessing to be around. She was about 52 years old, and she was a recent widow. And uh, one of the weird things that happened in her interview process is she said, you know, my husband died about a year ago, and I told God that I'd give him five more years of service on planet Earth. And then I wanted him to take me home. At the time, she was 52 years old and way too young to die, and we hired her partly because we thought we were going to have her for a long time. But we were surprised when uh, three years later, Carla got a brain cancer called glioblastoma. And I don't know if you guys know about this kind of cancer, but it's an aggressive, fast-moving cancer that has fingers that get all over the brain. And Carla went through two different surgeries, and I was her pastor through all of that. And she did all the right medical stuff. But in the end, the doctor said, it's just growing too fast. And so she went to hospice care in her home, and I visited her. And I was oftentimes tearful because she was, she was like a second mom to me during that time. Nobody prayed for me like Carla prayed for me. And I was going to miss her. And I remember her lying in that bed, and she would hold my hand in her hands and see my tears, and she would say, you know, Mark, I'm going to go and be with Jesus pretty soon. I'm going to beat you there. I said, yeah, I know, Carla. And she would say, you know what? My husband's been waiting for me for nearly five years, and it's time for me to go see him. I said, I know, Carla. And she said, you know, when I get there, they don't have glioblastoma in heaven. My body's going to be healed, and I'm going to get a new body. You know that, don't you? And I said, yeah, I know, Carla. She said, well, then rejoice with me because I'm about to be raised from the dead. It was a couple of days later that we gathered around Carla's bedside, me and her four kids who were all about the same age as me. And I remember us holding hands and singing, great is thy faithfulness. And it was in that moment that she slipped into the arms of Jesus 
She went exactly the way she would have wanted to go. And I thought at that moment, when I grow up, I want to be like Carla Potter. In fact, that year was the year that Haven was born. And we named Haven, Haven Carlisa Ashton. And her middle name, Carlisa, is the combination of two women of God, Carla and Lisa, who we wanted Haven to grow up to be like. Because I want to have a daughter who grows up to face fear with confidence. One who can stare death in the face. And that's what resurrection power does for you. I want not only Haven, but also me and all of you to be able to have unswerving hope for the future. That's what resurrection power does. I want us all to grow up with the concept that we are going to be able to have with confidence a reunion with our loved ones. And that's what resurrection power does for you. And Easter was designed to answer the question, can you cheat death? And the resounding and powerful answer behind that is yes, yes, you can. It's all about who you trust not about how good you are. And you can trust anybody you want for your resurrection. I mean, you can trust a self-help guru. You can trust Milo. You can trust the Easter bunny. But as for me, as for me, I'm going to place my trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. Because of all of the figures in world history, of all the politicians and poets and philosophers and religious leaders, there is only one who rose from the dead. Only one who has an empty tomb. Only one who has appearance after appearance and historical notes showing that, yes, in fact, you can break the death barrier. And so today, I want to invite you to say yes to Jesus. You might be a kid who's watching this message and going, can I say yes to Jesus? You bet you can. If you trust in Jesus for eternal life, he'll change you from the inside out and he'll help you to be able to cheat death. You might be a skeptic and you've been saying, I've been running from Jesus for a long time. Can I make today my day? Yes, you can. You might be somebody who's gone to church a lot. You've been really religious, like Nicodemus was really religious, but you've never been born again. You've never said, I trust resurrection power for myself. I turn over all of my life to Jesus. It's not just about being moral and being connected to moral people, friends. It's about a lifelong devotion to trusting Jesus and his resurrection power. So today I want to say yes. I want to give you the chance to say yes for the first time. And I'm going to invite you all in your homes all around Omaha, all around the country, to be able to say yes to Jesus right now. And your first step in doing that is to pray. And I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. I want to ask you in your homes to bow your heads and to pray this prayer along with me if today is the day that you want to say yes to Jesus. Can we pray together? Father, I want to pray for my friends who are at home right now. Maybe their hearts are touched. Maybe their minds have been opened. Maybe you're at work in them in a powerful way and they can't even describe it, but it's like that wind of the Holy Spirit that's at work in them. Help them to say yes right now. And if you want to say yes to Jesus, then pray this prayer along with me. Jesus, I believe today. I believe in your death on the cross. I believe in your resurrection from the dead. And I believe that I can cheat death by trusting in you, by your resurrection power. You're welcome to come live inside me. Please make your home right here. And I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus, who died for me and broke the death barrier. Amen. Well, friends, if you're somebody who prayed that prayer for the first time today, I want to congratulate you and say welcome to the family of God. Let's applaud for them all over Omaha, all over the world. You can't hear it, but you're getting applause from all over the place that you have made a decision to be a follower of Jesus. And I'm so grateful for that. 
You know, I want to invite you to do two things as a result of being a follower of Jesus. Actually, one is something I want everybody to do, and one is for people who have made a decision at this point in their lives or are curious for more. And the first thing I want to do is I want to use our survey to find out where you're at spiritually. So if you could pull out your phones one last time, we would love to be able to figure this out. You've got four choices. They go around A, B, C, D. Choice number one is A, already following Jesus. So if you're someone who says, you know what, I've been following Jesus for a long time, I'm following him today, but this is not a new thing for me, you would be in category number one. If you're somebody who says, today is the day that I prayed that prayer, I'm a believer today, I joined you in that, I experienced resurrection power today, then you would be in part B, I'm believing today. If you're somebody who is in section 3C, that would be someone who says, I'm curious. I'm curious, but I'm questioning. You're like Nick at night who came in and said, you know what? I want to find out more. Or maybe you're in four. Maybe you're in category four. That's D. I don't buy it. I, I don't believe that this is really true. Don't even call me. Don't even think about it. Uh, maybe that's the case for you. And if it is, then uh, that's fine. We respect you. In fact, for all of these, we're not collecting any of this data to find out, you know, people's phone numbers. We're not going to call you back. We just want to give an opportunity to be able to celebrate with you. And if you have multiple people in your house who have got multiple different kinds of questions or responses that go along with this, some that are believing, some that are curious, some that are already followers, whatever, it's fine. You can text in multiple times for the different people who have different responses in your family. But there's a bunch of people there, it looks like. I don't know how many people uh, are out there who are saying yes to Jesus, but we can see that there are some who have believed today, and we are very, very grateful for the way that God is at work in your life. The last thing I want to invite you to do today before I uh, jump down is this. We've created a special resource that's designed just for you. It's a resource of coaching about how to be a new believer, how to be a follower of Jesus. And I've personally put these together. These are three six to eight minute videos that we would love to be able to send to you if you're somebody who said yes. So if you're somebody who put in B, I believe today, or even if you're someone who put in C, you say, I'm curious about this, I would love to hear this new believer material that's out there, then you can text uh, made new to 474747. So just pull that out on your phone, 474747, text made new. What we'll do is we will collect your phone number on this one, and we will send you those new believer videos coaching you on your new life in Christ. I'm so grateful for all of you. I'm so grateful for the power of Jesus that broke the death barrier. I'm so grateful for the resurrection that comes in and changes our lives. We got one final song that we would love to sing together with all of you. And if you feel like standing in your living rooms, that would be awesome at this point. It's a song that we all love. It's a song that retells the story of Jesus. It's like the Christ Community Church anthem in Christ alone. And we would love to have all of you join us for this song.
with you today on this Resurrection Sunday. I'd like to send you out with some words from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Four verses. The first three are verses of, of hope and promise. And the final verse is a verse of, of exhortation. So listen. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Have a good rest of your Easter day. We'll see you next Sunday.